great importance. There he is! Got him! Most of us didn't really think that it was a company. It's just like, guys, let's make games because we can. With the demos in background, we had a pretty good technical base. There were no third-party engines out there. You had to actually do pretty much everything on your own. We didn't have the experience. The only thing that we knew how to do was to work on it until it's good. When we ended up using photos as textures, and that's how I became Max Payne. For a long way, we took the feedback from fans to heart. We became more and more ambitious. We're trying to tell an intricate, complex story in our games. Five minutes in, you're like, God damn it, <laughs> this is really good. People often recognize what is a Remedy game because there's something different to it always. The thing to me that still shocks me is it's from Finland, a tiny Nordic country in Europe, that they just produce this massive cultural impact. Anybody that wants to fund a game, the first question is how much and when is it going to come out? That was their cocky answer, is like, when it's done. Remedy has its roots in the demo scene, which is a mostly North European phenomenon. A musician, an artist and a coder come together, they try to create a really smooth experience with usually some text or logo, and this is us, hi, you lamers and losers, we're the cool ones. Okay, these are, I don't know, 15-year-olds, maybe. We had these demo scene events like assembly and We'd all pack on two buses and go to the party in Denmark. And it's just row after row with everyone's playing different music and everyone's hacking and everyone's just modding. It's ridiculous. They were just showing off lighting effects or coding. And 3D. Inventive visual tricks. They try to make the computer do stuff that they normally don't do. Everybody was just killing themselves trying to show off their skills. It was like a nerd rave. <laughs> There was PC demo scene, uh, Amiga demo scene, and, and Atari demo scene. You have rivaling groups. Our kind of hacker group is called the Aggression. We were mostly an Atari ST. When I saw what people are actually able to do on Amigas and early PCs, just blew my mind. Certain names became very famous among youth. Future Crew was a big name on PC scene. Watching the demos that Future Crew made, like literally every day, it was amazing to see what they could do. Rather quickly they rang us up and said that, hey, we're collecting this group of people who are into games and creating this umbrella called Remedy. And would you care to join us? All of us were kind of in that stage to try to decide what to do with our lives after school and games was kind of a natural progression from that. I remember when there was like rumblings that the Future Crew folks and some other groups are getting together and making games and everybody was in their 20s and I thought that that's, that's really cool. I couldn't wait to see like what they were going to achieve. Most of us didn't really think that it was a company. It was kind of this loose group of people in the, one of the founding members' basement. <laughs> so, you know, the parents' house basement. There were desks with computers and then there were mattresses under those desks because at some point people need to sleep as well. And pizza boxes everywhere and that kind of a environment. We started in the basement, then we slowly took all of the you know, floors of the house. They were like two, two, two floors on top and then one below. Obviously, during the Future Crew times, we had done a few kind of game-like things, but just doing a full-blown game, it's a completely different ball game. We were just making it up as we went. No long debates and, well, we should have more ideas on the table to choose from. It was the first idea and then we went with that. There were no third-party engines out there back then. You had to actually do pretty much everything on your own. And we had the guys who had the passion and talent to do that. From what I've understood, it, it's just like, you know, guys, let's make games because we can. And we would do so much better than you know, anyone else because we know computers so well. We had some contacts with the 3D arms guys through the demo scene, had some contacts with Epic who were working with them. We just had a cool prototype. Death Rally was a top-down racing game with the network abilities so you could play against your friends. It was originally called High Speed and it didn't have any guns. 
That was added there with cooperation with 3 Arms. George Broussard and Scott Miller really taught us a lot about how to think about entertainment. I've never forgotten that. I think every game needs to have a bit of Texas in it. I'm childhood friends with Petri Järvilehto, one of the founding members of Remedy. Petri came to me and said that they'll need texts for the game. You know, just a couple of lines of explanations to the player of, of what are they supposed to do. It was like, yeah, you have three lines here that you can fill, and I was looking at the bottom of the screen. Well, there is this white black margin here. You're not using that for anything. Can I fill that up? And yeah, sure, you can. <laughs> Thanksgiving Eve, we drove to Dallas with a shitty 84 Camaro. <laughs> Parked it next to all of the really high-end sports cars of, of 3D Realms and went to show the game to the guys. And I heard a few weeks back from Finland that the contract had been signed, that they'd really liked it. We had one concept called Dark Justice, which was this idea of a near-future truck war kind of a setting. And when I came in, I wanted to change that to present day and brought in the idea of, you know, hard-boiled crime fiction and film noir sensibilities in, into it. And then Petri came in to be the lead designer and he was a big fan of Hong Kong action movies like John Woo, you know, bullet time, slow motion. And he wanted to find a way to bring that in the mix. We were talking with the guys in Texas and, and they were suggesting that Dark Justice seems rather kind of smart and adult dark noir name, but I think we need more sexiness, if you will, catchiness. And I think there was a bunch of names like Dick Justice, Max Heat, then there was Max Payne. We felt if any of these, then maybe Max Payne. The story of Max Payne is a story of a cop who is doing well with his life. He has a lovely family, he's doing well in his work, and then horrible thing happens. His family is murdered and his world is blown apart. From that point on, he is driven by just one thing, figuring out, first of all, what happened and trying to find those who are to blame and have his revenge. The images were dark. I remember him holding his dead wife, and I think there was a crib with blood in it, I mean. I was worried that people would just miss the story and, you know, go with the action. Because of that, all the extreme metaphors and constant kind of rapid-fire narration, that's where it came from. That was three years ago. Everything ripped apart in a New York minute. The killer junkies had been high on a previously unknown designer drug, Valkyr, V. After the funeral, I told Alex I'd be transferring to the DEA. Looking back, that's how it became something that people remember. With the demos in background, we had a pretty good technical base, and then you didn't have the tools necessary, so we created our tools. Even our prototype engine in 98, I think, had the slow motion feature. We knew that this is the inspiration of this game, but the exact way of using it didn't came until rather late in the project. We tried many different things, like just having certain rooms in the sequence be in bullet time. This was very frustrating. When you wanted to move, you were moving like, Ugh. and if the AI decided that one of the guys starts running out of the room, then you were chasing the guy in slow motion. Stop, I need to kill you only kind of long way into the project, suddenly someone thought about the idea that let's give it as a resource to the player, and then it started really working. What the? Well, bullet time was just fucking cool. This sort of amped up your abilities without turning you into a superhero. You were still were a human, you still had technically human abilities, but you suddenly were able to operate in this way that made you feel like a god. I would say that was the most important differentiator of the actual gameplay mechanic. The first time we met him at that E3 98, I mean, the game was not very far along, obviously. They showed up with this demo and everybody was just like, holy shit, did you see the Max Payne thing with the cigarette? But there was no game there. 
what we at the time lacked was a solid schedule. So the only thing that we knew how to do was to work on it until it's good. Anybody that wants to fund a game, the first question is how much and when is it going to come out? Reasonable question if you're throwing a couple of million bucks at something. And uh, that was their cocky answer. It's like, when it's done is when it's coming out. Fans got used to following the story of a game not coming out <laughs> for years at a time. Max Payne is definitely fun, but it's also, I'd like to think that it's definitely art. Along the way, the fidelity of graphics was going forward so fast that Petri and I were talking about it that, you know, we should actually use photos as textures because that would be a big leap in realism. And that was a hard debate inside the team because at that point still many of the artists saw that as cheating. You know, no, no, we can't use photos. We need to, you know, paint these things. That's how it's been always done. It was a big transition along the way. Remedy flew from Finland to New York and with Police escorts went to the darkest, seediest, most dangerous buildings in New York and took tons of photos. When we ended up using photos, then I was there as Max Payne, you know, with the now famous constipated grimace on my face. The earliest conception of Max Payne looked completely different. It didn't have slow motion. It was more kind of an isometric viewpoint. It was nice to see how that evolved over the years. I had met Lupino only once. The gangster ran all his rackets through his right-hand man, Vinny Gagnidi. Gagnidi was a high-strung whiner on the verge of breaking apart, like an over-amped Energizer bunny. He had the brains to run the business, but he lacked the balls, always falling short, taking his frustration out on underage addicts and call girls. Those days, how you can do cutscenes that was really crude. I suggested that, hey, we could use graphic novel kind of storytelling. Let's use that between the levels. Cutscenes at the time, mocap at the time, animation was extremely expensive. So I think one of the key factors in making the original graphic novel pages was how to save money. I think using the graphic novel stuff instead of using cutscenes was genius. I mean, I think that's what helped people invest in the story. Whoever is reading just fills in the gaps and imagines most of it actually in their heads. I think it's a good example of the hacker culture again. When you have limited resources like we did, you always try to turn your weak points into your strong points. I was ready for any kind of public response, to maybe just to prepare myself for the potential disappointment. But on the other hand, there was a clear indication of that this might actually really be something and bigger than we ever thought. I think we realized that we had a hit on our hands when we started seeing the reviews, the full-on 90s everywhere. And I think there was a couple of videos that got released by fans. There was this one guy who was playing the game and he was shouting on the background like, wow, and every time there was a bullet, I'm, oh man, and I think that made a lot of rounds and, and it, it only got bigger from there. National News took notice of it and, and reported on it. The newspapers wrote, wrote about Max Payne and Remedy's success, so you literally could show, you can actually make a living out of making games or writing about them in Finland. So that, to me, was the most significant thing. Max Payne was super important for the game industry in that it really propelled, I think, the idea of story being important and mood being important, especially for an action game. The thing to me that still shocks me is it's from Finland, of all places, like a tiny Nordic country in Europe that they just produce this massive cultural impact. Before Max Payne 2, we had sold the franchise to Rockstar. Part of the deal was that we'll make the sequel. It was a nice way of saying goodbyes to Max Payne. I'll deal with Payne. He's as good as dead. Freeze, NYPD! Max Payne 2, I think, is a unique production in Remedy's history because it was done fairly quickly, basically relying a lot on Max Payne 1 as, as a foundation for the game. And many of the mechanics kind of remained the same, but were kind of expanded. We actually could represent all the major 
features of the human face. We evolved our techniques, how, how to generate textures from these reference shots. That was sort of upgrade. While in Max Payne 1, the bullet time was like a uniform rule at everything, like how, how you can move and how the enemies can move. It was the same for everybody. In Max Payne 2, those rules got a bit more loose, where Max could actually, at relative speed, kind of move differently, faster compared to everybody else. There's more freedom of movement while the bullet time was on. Between the two games, I went to Theatre Academy of Finland to actually study screenwriting <laughs> for a couple of years. I just wanted to do a more ambitious story. We're losing him. Multiple gunshot wounds, pupils blown, head trauma, God only knows what else. He's shock. Start two large four IVs, get him to ICU. He's right. not responding. This guy is a train wreck. We're losing him. When I woke up in the hospital earlier tonight, I thought it couldn't get any worse. In Max Payne 2, we find Max who has had his revenge, but that doesn't give him his happiness or his life back. So he's in a bad place. And then his past starts appearing. You're always sort of dreading what's going to happen with a sequel or worried. And the nice thing about video games, unlike films, is typically games often get better in their second and third and fourth go round. Max Payne 2 was one where the technology didn't necessarily improve, but it really showed that they were able to tell another really big, interesting, very different story in the same world. I had already left by the time the box art was finalized, but I don't think I would have used the cover the way that it ended up. The name of the game was just so long and it took up so much space. Max Payne 2, The Fall of Max Payne, a film noir love story. I, I think if I look back working with Rockstar and we also had 3 Day Rams involved, I think that was a really interesting time. The Rockstar guys were really passionate about everything and what they did, but still we had pretty full creative freedom to do things the way we wanted to do. I think that was really, really fruitful cooperation. After having working with Max Payne so long, actually seven years in total with Max Payne 1 and 2, we wanted to repeat where we were good at, but then still make it fresh and uh, renew it also for ourselves. It was almost a cliche of a band releasing their first album and it becomes a massive hit and then you need to, at some point, create the second album. We started out as a free-roaming sandbox game. We wanted to, you know, let the player do whatever they want. Trying to kind of bring the sandbox elements to Alan Wake proved tricky because we wanted to have this believable, relatable world, uh, but also kind of give the player the freedom to roam the countryside. But we quickly understood that it's not really possible to populate that kind of big world with all the resources we have. Basically what we decided to do at the end of the day was to focus on things that we know well. So going to this more uh, linear experience where we have control of the kind of the scenes and how they're set up and how they progress. But at the same time, creating a feeling of kind of open spaces. And I think it's a kind of a good middle ground that we figured out there at the end. In a horror story, the victim keeps asking why, but there can be no explanation and there shouldn't be one. The unanswered mystery is what stays with us the longest, and is what we'll remember in the end. My name is Alan Wake. I'm a writer. A big thing for me in Alan Wake was, can we do a hero in an action game who is not an action hero, you know, by profession? From that thought, process came the idea that let's have a writer as the main character. And that's how Alan Wake as a character was born. Welcome to the Oh Dear Diner. Hi, I was wondering if you could help me. I'm looking for- Mr. Wake, Alan Wake, oh God, I am your biggest fan. In his career as a writer, he has written hard-boiled crime fiction and has been very, very successful in that. But then he decides to abandon that and you know publicly makes the announcement that now I'm writing something else but he's faced with the horrible writer's block and there's been years and he hasn't been able to you know write anything and that's part of the end up darkness in his head that starts to come out. 
How does it feel to die by the hands of your own creation? Alan Wake wrote crime stories in New York, stories that were not completely unlike Max Payne's story had been. We had flashbacks of Alan Wake being at his home during a really huge snowstorm, and obviously Max Payne started with the big snowstorm. In many ways, it was an echo of Max Payne. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have for you tonight. I want to thank all our guests for the evening, Alan Wake, Sam Lake. Once more, do the face for his Sam. <laughs> it was more like a just for the fans and to make it interesting for ourselves as well. Early on, it was clear that we wanted light to be a fundamental element of the game. We had the capability of a dynamic time of the day in the engine at that point. We could press a button and the sun would go around. That just felt like something that we wanted to use. Battery was really kind of keen on that there is that shooter part of it. Then it was that light is something that you use to banish the protective darkness from your enemies and then you can shoot them. We actually have a pretty complicated setup of story moments, driving a car, the horror experience that you have in the forest and also this kind of action game elements as well. And also the kind of eternal battle between light and darkness. So it's a pretty complicated package of elements that I think mesh really well together. And I'm proud of that achievement. I started a magazine called Pelaya. I think we did like three different covers on Alan Wake, like one year, okay, it's like a year away. Okay, great, like let's do a preview. Then a year after that, it's like, okay, they're doing something different with Wake, so doing another cover. And I remember very well when they finally called me, hey, come down to Remedy and you can play Alan Wake. And this was after something like four years of like seeing it at trade shows and everything. I was like, oh shit, like it's, it's, it's real now. And when I started playing it, I could like see some of, some of the higher ups like hovering around outside the meeting room, like, okay, he's playing, like, what does he think? And, and I, quite, I quite liked it. And we had seen previews of it for years uh, at the Microsoft press conferences and things like this and seeing these unbelievable landscapes and kind of insane levels of graphics. This is what it can do and then it got delayed and delayed and delayed. It was almost like it was going to be vaporware. And then all of a sudden it's about to come out and they give us a demo of the level of it. And it's a guy with a flashlight and he's shining light and it says like, follow the light. And I was super unimpressed by the press demo that I got. I walked away from that going, Oh no, like I had really high hopes for this game and it's Remedy and oh, they're the Max Payne guys and ah, uh, and then the game came out and it blew me away. When Alan Wake came out, it did okay. It wasn't like a massive overnight success. I was working in the press and I remember I actually got a call from some business paper or something and they were like, well, this didn't sell like Max Payne, like is it over for Remedy? And I'm like, the game industry changes so rapidly. 1999, 2000, 2003 were completely different from like 2010. So it's not like you're gonna sell like four million like right out of the block and all that. And I was like really sort of defensive uh, about that for Remedy. Yeah, I think we took kind of the feedback from fans to heart. The faces were somewhat criticized and for good reason, in my opinion also. It was one of the bits of the game which I felt that, okay, yeah, given a little more time little more bandwidth, this is the first thing we need to fix. We got so much you know, slack from that, that we were like, hey, let's make you know, the best possible facial animation, you know, let's show everybody. Let's, you know, let's not suck again. It took so long with Wake, it was great to see that they were able to make like another game in like 18 months. Uh, which was American Nightmare, which was of course, well, you know, smaller scale, downloadable game, but it, it sort of took the extremes of Alan Wake and played around with them. It added some more live action, just like a different experience. When you look at Alan Wake, which was all about the, the kind of a Stephen King novel being a game, American Nightmare was more like a kind of a B a movie type of a thing. Very different experiences, but we managed to kind of have the same elements at play. And I think it was a great demonstration of the flexibility of that, you know, universe. Alan Wake American Nightmare just reminded me of how cool these guys are and I used to work in film and from there I just I was so inspired by what they were doing and just the storytelling, the atmosphere 
Alan Wake is the reason I came to Remedy. After Alan Wake, we started having discussions about the next thing. Very, very early on, there was the idea that it should be focused on interactive narrative. From that, naturally came the idea that let's give the player some kind of a power to affect the story. The kind of a starting point was taking time as a concept and trying to figure out how can we take that and build unique abilities for the player. In the same way as we took light in Alan Wake, we wanted the time to be the same kind of weapon for the player as well. The number one killer is time. It will get us all. In some ways, Quantum Break, it's a time travel story, but at the same time, I see it as a superhero origin story. Jack, who is our hero, and Paul Serene. They are childhood friends. They are both there at the beginning of the game at Riverport University, and there is a time travel related science experiment that goes horribly wrong. There is a fracturing time. Both Jack and Paul are doused with chronon energy and they gain these superpowers. And then it really is a big philosophical fight between the two characters. We've been kind of working our way towards the idea of even more live action. And this was there as an idea that whatever we do next, we should have some kind of live action show element running parallel to the game experience. We end each act of the game with a scene where you play the bad guy. And he has this time power that the hero doesn't have. He can see glimpses of two potential futures. And then you, playing the bad guy, make the choice which future becomes the actual future in my Quantum Break experience. And that's where the game act ends. And then we unlock an episode of the show. The live action show, it's around 22 minutes, which is like a standard television broadcast. It's not broadcast on television, it's only with the game. And the thing that's interesting is the episode length changes. With each episode, because of your decisions in the game, it may become longer or shorter. So it's unlike any other show, you're actually kind of directing the story in a way. I, I think the TV show gives an excellent additional perspective into the lives of the villains. And I, I think it kind of brings more gravity to the moments when you actually meet these people on the game side. It not only gives you more replay value because you have more story to experience, but it also ties you a lot more, in my opinion, into the whole game story and game experience and the game world. I think the biggest challenge in Quantum Break was to figure out how do we build the different experiences in such a way that they mesh well together and support each other and still kind of remain also meaningful. We had the production designer here, the cinematographer, they came to Remedy, they looked at our concept art, and we really tried to make it all connect. Occasionally it was hard because you had this different group of people which kind of worked a bit separately from us. Work goes four on that front, and then you have to kind of steadily review and make sure that all the different things we're doing in the game side actually works with the TV show side and so on. So there was a lot of communication and feedback loops that had to happen for it to work. It was definitely a new experience for us and we learned a lot. It's been challenging, but I'm, I'm really happy that we took the challenge and I think that this is something that no one has done before and, and something new. I think the most impressive thing about Quantum Break is that we're able to pull it off. I'm quite confident that when people are like, why, why are you doing this and mixing live action and time travel? Like when you play it, you're like, ah, oh, this makes sense. I think the single proudest thing for me in Quantum Break is how we managed to kind of keep the element of time at the core of the experience. It's elegant. As, as a package, and that's something that I'm proud of as, as a designer as well. The facial animation technology we have, I think, is spectacular. We can really almost create like these digital doubles. We're the first really cool action cinematic time travel game, and I've always wanted to play that, and it just hasn't existed, and I feel like we're kind of bringing this to the gamers and to the world, which is really cool. I think what is absolutely necessary if you want to work in the game industry is to be passionate about games. You have to play a lot of games and you have to have this inbuilt desire to understand how games work. Be curious. For me, that's always been my driving force. Do something on your own, learn. It takes time and practice to be the best you can be. Make a game. Just go make one. It is easier than it has ever been in history. Go make something small and that will teach you an immense amount and then you can build from there.
You can have all kinds of ideas, but if you have a group of people believing in an idea, then miracles will happen. If I could convey all the experience I've gained over the years to young Saku, that would be awesome, but obviously that would require some time manipulation. I think it's extremely important for Remedy to be able to evolve. As an independent studio, I think we need to differentiate from everybody else, and we need to keep being creative, testing and, and taking risks as well. The only thing that we want to do is to create compelling experiences that have really innovative and cool gameplay, but also at the same time tell a story that not many other studios are either willing or capable of telling. Overall, I expect us to keep conquering new grounds, finding new ways to tell stories, being meaningful, being relevant, making a change, and influencing people. I want to ship more games more often. I want to keep the ambition level high. I want to give the creative guys the space they need. I want to bring great experience to gamers more often. I want to be able to capture this this scene where a guy is running from a you know huge explosion and jumps from from you know whatever bridge down and we can capture everything you know his face voice the blushing on on his you know skin everything so that's where we are going I hope <laughs> at some point we had our 20th anniversary party and somebody toasted for here's for next 20 years and somebody then had to yell and three more games <laughs> so we can laugh about the fact that we do take a while but I think the future is, is exciting. We're still independent, still very, very hungry, and it's very tough to be an independent game developer who, who makes big AAA experiences like we do. It's, it's a very risky, risky business, but we have a lot of experience, and we know that when push comes to shove, we can really, really deliver. That, that is that Finnish spirit. We're very used to working really, really hard and just getting shit done. That's about as sweet a story as you're gonna get. Some childhood friends that started in a basement and are now like in the biggest of the big leagues of game developers. We've been lucky <laughs> being able to do these projects with really talented team because that's what games are. They're made by teams. It's been quite a ride. <laughs>